something like that. And in perturbative string theory, this thing is expressed as a sum over some genus G of some quantity Gn, and then powers the string contained constant Gs to the power 2G. And this is the, we have a perturbative expression with the string contained constant. Then this thing is just a coefficient in front of the power of each thing. So and the point is that the genus G part will be computed in terms of some string propagating in some target space. So maybe I show it X with some kind of target space with some metric. And to compute this quantity, you are looking to string worksheet. We define some topological surface of some genus G. And then you are looking to maps from such surface to your target space. Okay. And so first of all, if you fix a metric on this worksheet, right there for H, the metric of the worksheet, so for a fixed metric here, you can consider the two-dimensional field theory living on this worksheet. With field isolated maps to the target set. So you get a two dimensional column field theory, which is the sigma model of target X. And then what you insert is vertex operators are naturally part of this theory. So, first of all, you Compute correlation functions on these observables in C's column field theory. So maybe I will be made here. So if I'll fix me quickly to compute this correlation function in fact two dimensional column field theory. And then you couple this theory to two dimensional gravity. So essentially you integrate the whole possible matrix of the worksheet. And so you can do that in the physical string. So if the 2D quantum field theory is conformal of the right of charge. It is something in the condition of the three code dimension. So maybe C goes 26, so the total extreme of 15 in the best string theory, then you can couple to to the matter of gravity, which means that you can integrate to a space of all possible metrics. This is quantity will only depend only on the metric up to perform all transformations. And so at the end of the day, what you do is integrate over the space MGN of matrix up to perform all transformations. Which is the same thing. So here is an elementary but crucial point, which is a metric on such topological surface up to perform a transformation is the same as a complex structure on this surface. It's the same thing as a structure of Freeman surface on this picture. It is the same thing as MGN, it's the same thing as states of all possible genus G surface, Freeman surface. N mark points. So you have the N mark points when you insert the value. Okay. So, so what is really important is that this MGN is in some finite dimensional object. So, it's a first approximation to the complex manifold of the dimension being minus three. And 
or the Excel sheets that we say this, this thing is a nice complex manifold of the complex version. And uh, yes, and only it's one of the key points of this theory, which is like right here when you say couple to two dimensional gravity, it looks like one to two dimensional metric, which is some infinite dimensional thing. But because of quotient by conformal transformations, at the end of the day, you get this nice finally like of space. And, and so this kind of integral here uh, has some uh, chance to make sense. And so at the end of the day, this integral is exactly what it is. What it is. Mm -hmm. Another topological string is some variant of this story. So I hear it, but I will write something very similar. So in the topological string, you start essentially uh, in the same way. You start with the uh, target space X. But uh, for this particular topic, you want this thing to be a Kähler manifold. And maybe to be safe, let me say compact. So in the prior story to have a reasonable physical interpretation, maybe you want to assume that your X has some factor which is in Kosky space or LES space or something. But in this story, it's better to think of this space as being compact. So you should think about it as being something like the compact space is in geometry on which you compactify to get uh, to some lower dimensional in Kosky space. So it has a clear manifold, which means it has a metric, and it is a complex manifold, it has a complex structure. Which is a field of automorphism of the certain bundle, and out of the metric and the complex structure, you can construct some two form. And you want the two form to be closed to the clever condition. Okay, so here there's a piece of differential geometric data. And then uh, you consider the same thing as before, you consider maps from such. Human surface to X. And before I was not really precise if I was talking about the bosonic sigma model or the supersymmetric sigma model. And here, if you really consider the supersymmetric sigma model of maps from the human surface to X, then because of this scalar condition, which is a two dimensional quantum field theory, there's a large amount of supersymmetry that can go to two. The symmetry, and each time you have this amount of CP symmetry, you can do something called, called topological twist. <clears throat> so essentially, you use that you see the n equal to two, the algebra, there is some new and one symmetry, and we twist. The spin assignment of the field using the R symmetry. So we're not going to the detail of that, just to say that there is some rigidity from out of this physical two dimensional quantum field theory to construct something for the two dimensional topological quantum field theory. And there is two ways to do that one which is called the A model and one which is called the B model. And the one relevant to Gramophilian theory is the one called the A model. Okay, so what does it mean to be a two dimensional quantum field theory? Here in this context, this means that there is, in such a theory, there is some functional charge, which is the periodic charge, and which square uh, to zero. And in particular, the observables of this theory. Will be 
defined by looking at all characters in the theory, which would be Q close, so annihilated by Q, and divided by the one which are Q exact, so which are Q of something. And in this particular case of the A model, you can show that essentially the space of uh, fields after twist can be essentially identified with the space of differential forms for the space X. And this Q can be essentially identified with the exterior differential, the Durand differential on the space of differentials. And so at the end of the day, this type of observing will be simply the Durand description of the cohomology of that. And then we'll take our observable for one, two, for n, there will be elements here. So, unlike what happened in the physical stream, where typically you have some infinite dimensional space of the left operator, here you have some finite dimensional space of the hidden insertion. And then you do essentially the same thing as before, you consider condition functions of the observable in this particular two dimensional. Topological quantum field theory, and you couple such a thing to the topological version of two dimensional graph. So at the end of the day, you can open something that you can integrate over the same space M here. Maybe I'll wrap that again. I'm going to have something integrated in here. You can have a parameter function in my two dimensional column phase theory. And this correlation function in the two dimensional topological column phase theory is some kind of path integral over the field, some set of fields in my 2D theory. That's my, my operator insertion. And Maybe some kind of Euclidean version of that integral. And the remarkable fact is because of this topological property, because of the existence of this charge Q, in some appropriate limit, essentially, if you retain the matrix G of the target space, uh, T times G, if you take the limit T goes to infinity, then this path integral will localize. Of the field configuration which are annihilated by Q. And if you think about what it means, this thing will localize. Remember, if you think it's some kind of integral over all possible maps from Riemann surface to X. And if it's limited, integral will be <coughs> localized on holomorphic maps. Okay, so in the physical string, when you want to compute the two-dimensional correlation function, you need to do some one f infinite-dimensional and two-dimensional path integral. And in this topological string story, everything localized on this very, very much smaller subset of holomorphic maps. And so at the end of the day, you can rewrite. Is an uh, expression uh, integral over what I would call M D M theta X. Yeah, so some remark is that in various maps from C to X, they land in different topological classes with each other. Remember, surface inside X, it defines some homology class. In degree two of x, and so you can think so you need to compare all these topological sectors for uh, some of our such classes. And then I introduce a modic space mg and bi, which are just a modic space of pairs where c is a very much surface. And F is some holomorphic map.
from C to X. So from all this space, cut together the complex structure here, and then the holomorphic mask from C0 to H2. And then you can check that the uh, physically defined insertions of the so called equal quantum field theory at the end of the day are some completely like classically mathematical sense. You can write them like I can maybe now uh, change that limitation. Before I was denoted by OI, some operator in the theory. And I said a set of operators in the space of cohomology. And now I set the chain rotation, I see that by alpha i. So show you the same thing, but I really want to think about it as an honest cohomology class without any kind of physical interpretation that some operators have to come through. And, and so, so what is that? The point is that from P space, MGN theta n. Of every i running from one to n, we have some evaluation map x, which is evaluation as an i mark one. So if you have a map that occurs with some mark points and a map to x, if you have such piece of data, then you can just go to the image of the mark point x, xi by the map x. And then the alpha i are comedy classes here. You can cool them back by sigma up, you get comedy classes here. You take their cup product, but this thing is a commodity class of the more e space. So if you think in terms of differential form, just on differential form of the space, you integrate the differential form of this space. So beta is to run over effective uh, classes. Ah, yeah, so yeah, and I forgot to write, maybe I want to keep track of beta, which maybe contributes to action. So maybe here yeah, at the end, I just put some quite mm -hmm. And uh, and indeed, like uh, this thing will be non zero only if beta is effective. I mean, if there exists such form of the curve of class beta. If not, this thing will be empty. And if the degree of the form is, is large enough to be integrated on the, on the modelized space. Yeah? Ah, yeah, that's okay. And so the other remark is that this thing will be non zero <coughs> only if the degree of this differential form is equal to the dimension of the system. And so this thing is another remark, which is that this is. Uh, so before I made this point that the modulus space of Riemann surfaces is finite dimensional, and yet the crucial thing is that the modulus space of Riemann surface plus the one of the two x is still finite dimensional. And in nice cases, this is a complex manifold. Of complex immersion dimension of x to complex dimension of x minus two times one minus g as integral against beta of the first chain class of the tangent model of x. And so, indeed, if you want to get a non zero number. You need the sum of the degrees of this commodity class alpha i to be exactly equal to C squared. Okay, so now it will be essentially the end of the like, physics related discussion because now the, the point is that its final expression. Is somehow entirely finite dimensional. It does not make any reference to the original two dimensional sigma model, it's to some two dimensional path integral. It's just some finite dimensional complex manifold and some integration of some commodity classes.
It's a question. Which is T lambda? Sorry? Which is T lambda? TX. Yeah, TX. And it is supposed to be a notation for the thousand bundle. Right. I think this is so x is a compact manifold yeah. of some dimension it has a total model which is some complex vector model of all the dimension and then it has a short chain class which is an element of the degree two homology that you can pair with the class of the degree two homology Yeah, so yeah, there are a few technical remarks made. So here I wrote something which may be a bit strange. I wrote something like in nice cases. So what does it mean exactly? It means that in general, it's not true that this thing is a nice complex manifold. It could be uh, very singular. And furthermore, to have a reasonable uh, theory, I should really have a compact uh, thing. So what we really consider is not it is not the space human surface plus all of it map, but you should replace it by the space denoted by mg and theta x, which is a space so called stable map. It's your space. Of pairs as before, I can now see is no longer a smooth from my surface, it can be a slightly singular from my surface. It can be, it be some atmos nodal from my surface. So before in my discussion, I was really thinking of C as being some honest smooth JFG thing, but to get a compact space in general, uh, you need to allow this thing to degenerate. And the point is that the space of smooth human surface is not compact. So you think can, if you move the compact structure, sometimes there is some obstruction to have a smooth limit. And so for example, you can get things like well, here you have the node. You just have two smooth human surfaces glued at a single point. So locally, the local model for what happens here is uh, locally it looks like xy equals to zero. That's just the two things splitting transversely at C four. I have a trivial confusion about the dimension formula here. If I take a Calabria of three, so the dimension would just be n. Yeah, so exactly. So in Calabria of three, the dimension would just be n. Then and usually, wouldn't... usually in Calabria of three, people take zero mark points. Okay. And then like, the dimension is zero, and you just expect a finitely many curves. So the maybe space should be zero dimensional, but should be finitely yeah, many points. Okay. And you can just the counter. Okay. And uh, yeah, so in Calabria, you can't. Play the game to add mark points, and then you get something like dimension n. But then, usually, what you can insert if you do that, you will not get something very more interesting. You know, yeah, you don't have one form to wedge together. Yeah, I mean, if anything is complex dimension, maybe if n equal one, you want to insert the two form. Oh, okay, sorry. And there are some two forms, but somehow putting a two form in Gamma Fulton is never interesting because it's like a divisor. And the curve always intersects the divisor, so you can always get, get rid of it. And the, the, so you can reduce in the case of the small mark point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I did for Calabria three fold, what people usually study is just the case of the zero mark point. Then this thing is just zero, you know, this space is expected to be finitely many points. And this thing is just a number of points, it's just a number of curves. Mm -hmm. Up to various technical things, but uh, what I did.
Okay, and so okay, so there is technically there is a precise definition of what is stable mass. So you have this kind of model curve and mass from the model curve to X. It needs to be stable, which means uh, the automorphism group. Once this data, TNF should be finite. This thing is a generalization of the size of Riemann surfaces. If you look to genus zero, like with no mark point, with a positive dimensional group of automorphisms, it's like non trivial canning vectors, and you don't want that in your face. So, so there is every such a thing as a constraint in the box. So you emphasize that Gromov written invariants were, were symplectic invariants, but here you're using, yeah, yeah, so you're using a complex that. structure. I'm going to say that in one minute, but that's exactly right. Could you define them if, even if you didn't have a complex structure, but just a normal complex structure? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's how you can do it. So if you, are, if you follow the symplectic view part, you understand the symplectic manifold, <clears throat> then you can show that there exists a compatible almost complex structure. And then you can look to essentially the same space here on surface and such a map, which is like, like a pseudo sort of holomorphic, holomorphic with respect to some of complex structure of T. And this definition is uh, maximum. And it is part of the story that the final answer will be independent of the choice of the complex structure. So, yeah, so it's actually related to some of these technical remarks. So, once you do that, you get some on that compact space. But still, in general, it is not smooth. Mm -hmm. That can be fine. Something you don't feel like that, which is called a virtual fundamental class, and which is the homology class of the moly space, which lives in the degree predicted by the dimension that I erased. So the dimension of that. So, so what is the point? The point is that in the ideal situation, the model space is compact, smooth of the dimension given by this formula. And then in top homology, just as a virtual class, just a fundamental class, if I just taking the variety itself. The point is that in general, maybe it is not smooth, so maybe it, it, could, it could even have the wrong dimension. So the dimension not given by this formula, but some bigger dimension. But the claim is very risky to define an element in homology which lives in some of the expected right dimension. And then in, the, in your definition of chromophobic invariant, maybe I will do it again. Like that. So, as before, you can see, you can see, in general, you integrate O against this class. And somehow, all the kind of technical difficulty of global frequency has to do with the construction, like the proper definition of this class. Now we'll not go into it except to say that some of my construction is maybe slightly complicated object is the one which ensures that this thing is deformation invariant. So it's independent of the complex structure. So this thing is such that if you say it numbers, I think it's a little bit of Uh, 
So say, oh, well, maybe maybe Satim of Pesa to say deformation invariant, meaning that if you put your compact manifold inside the smooth family of compact manifolds by deforming the complex structure, then locally such family is topologically trivial. So topologically, you can do the alpha i or the fiber of the family. You can identify one with the other, and the time then the massive numbers do not change. So the homology theory has to also be adapted so that it can be defined for a singular manifold. Yeah. So, but ordinary homology and ordinary algebraic topology makes sense for any reasonable space, even very singular. So, so here you can say it's, yeah, it's ordinary homology in like an algebraic topology sense. So you cannot define it in like the difference of forms, but you can define the singular chains, mm -hmm. and it makes sense. Are these numbers known to be rational in general? Yeah, so so maybe I should make a further comment on that. So so this class in general living homology with rational coefficients. And here I pretty I took alpha i. So when I was talking about differential form, maybe I was thinking the coefficient would be like C or R. Mm -hmm. But because this expression is clearly linear to the alpha i, so it's only necessary to know these numbers on basis of the cohomology. So there is no loss of generality to assume that the alpha i are rational coefficients. So in fact, up to scaling, you can even assume that they are in the image of the integral homology. And then these numbers, in general, to for such alpha i, they are rational numbers in general. And it's very good that maybe you make a remark because it can help me to make clearer the geometric meaning of this expression, which is that when alpha i is some cohomology class with integer coefficients, you can look to the Poincaré-Dual homology class. So if you have a cohomology class of degree k, you can look to co-dimension k and some manifolds whose homology is concretal to these given cohomology classes. And then the meaning of this expression is simply that you have a space x. And for every alpha i, you pick a sum manifold gamma i, some manifold. With homology class, class of gamma i is in Poincare dual of alpha i. So you make so you get a collection of some manifold inside x of various dimensions. And then the intuitive meaning of this expression is simply looking to Riemann surface and mapping holomorphically to this geometry with n manifolds. Well, the i smart point is asked to go with this sum manifold gamma i. Something like that. But the thing is, really, the more like classical enumerative geometry point of view on from a field and wire, you have a space, you know, that can't trim surface inside it, satisfying various kinds of constraints. So that you expect finitely many curves, and you can just count them when you get along. Okay, so in the Calabrian three-fold situation, there is nothing to fix. Even with that constraint, there is already only finitely many curves, and you just count them. But in some other kind of space, maybe there are like a lot of curves inside, families of curves, and then you impose various constraints to get finitely many curves. Maybe a stupid example: if X is a complex projective plane. If you just so you can think about it as being the honest plane, and you just look to curve degree one, you just look to lines inside the plane. And there are many such lines because you see lines with like family lines. But if you ask your lines to pass through two points, then there is a unique line. Okay, so this is alpha i, I exactly the 
shows of what constraints are important, they are not only the key points. Are you going to mention gravitational descendants as well? Or? Yes, it's still part of the remark. <laughs> Maybe. So here, just a cryptic remark, which is you might ask from a physical point of view, why do you see this subtlety? And I claim it has to do when you, in your pass integral, it has to do with zero modes, essentially. You have some operator and there's some channel, some co channel. And there is some index, which is this formula, so the index is constant. Mm -hmm. Sometimes have some special workers, you have a non short channel, a non short code channel, and some particular sub workers. And then you need to be careful. And so, so this is technical thing is what I'm trying to see. Okay, thank you. That's exactly my next remark, which is there's something called gravitational distance. Well, from what we did in mind, they're just integration over our modulus space of thermal mass, so thermal surface with our modulus of flex, or some commodity class. And here, usually, we take commodity classes which are pulled back from X of the variation. And then that's a nice geometric interpretation of imposing constraints of the curve. But then that you can you could put other commodity classes, which you can come up with the definition of more interesting commodity classes on this module. And in the physics language, the alpha i are like the observables of the two dimensional PQHT, so what you call column theory. And then you couple it to two dimensional topological gravity. And it happens that two dimensional topological gravity has, has its own observables. And so you might also want to put them inside. And so the mathematical definition of such a thing is as follows so for every math point, you can cook up a complex line model. Over moving space. So you give you a point into space, which is a human surface, you can map to X. And I want to give you a one dimensional complex vector space, which will be the fiber of this complex line model. And the one dimensional vector space that I put is a cotangent line model at the curve C at the i mark point. So maybe it is a slightly strange definition, it's typically the kind of tautological definition. So if you just look to the amount of data and you think what you can do with it. So the point is that you have a curve with a mark point, you can look to the yeah, it does not really matter if it's a tangent cotangent, you could just put some signs at the end of the day. It's more conventional to take a cotangent line to the curve as the ice mark. Okay, so C is a Riemann surface, it has complex dimension one. This cotangent space is a one dimensional complex vector space. And then when the curve moves inside the moving space, you get a family of complex lines until so you get the line model. And so obviously, locally, this thing looks trivial, it's just a one dimensional vector space. So the point is like globally, you think I'd form a non trivial complex line model. And if you think I actually keep track of that, so you psi cap psi i a definition of the first chain cap of these line models. So the measure how much these line models is non trivial. A natural code class is living here, and there is one for each marker. And so, in your definition of common filter variance, you might choose to also include that. So, there is a standard like correlative notation like 2 k1 to kn 
And finally, so now there is extra data, which are k1, kn, so integers. We just for each mark point. And this is an session as before, but you have to multiply by psi i to some power k i that you choose. They are just more general numbers. So when all the ki's are zero, then the same number as before. But when you have a non zero ki's, you get more numbers. And as before, to get a non zero number, now it's the sum of the degree of the alpha i, where the degree of the very thing should be equal to the situation of the state. This one generates a full homology of the modular space, or can so you calculate <coughs> probably not. So I think the answer is no. The brain generally is very difficult to come up with other classes. Uh, in, in fact, you can think about other and, and people study marginal things. But, but usually, what people call homogeneous is well, usually this particular set of environments. And the reason is because he said it's stable and there are many natural operations that you may want to do. So even if you don't like gravitational dissonance, you say, I don't want them. But then if you do various natural operations and see the various results, then, then they will appear natural. So which is why you, you, you want them. And so usually what you talk about with is this set of numbers. So they should, they should <coughs> come up with other common classes and definitely they exist because of marginal numbers. That doesn't mean that if you know the uh, complete invariance without gravitational dissonance, then uh, gravitational dissonance, then the ones with gravitational dissonance are determined in terms of the. In complete generality, it is uh, extra information. You cannot determine. But on a Calabrian three fold. Oh, okay, so on a Calabrian three fold, what you see are not interesting. Okay, to this further remark, because again, this thing has dimension of dimension zero. I mean, the, the interesting is when there is no mark. But I mean, uh, for GS0 and GS1, we need a structure to come mm -hmm. up with our three yes. the stability of uh, all the maps. No, no, actually, you don't need because uh, the stability has to do with the map. So, so even if there is no mark point in GS0, for example, yeah. as long as the curve class beta is non zero, then this thing is considered as being stable. Because there is automorphism of the zero zero curve, but it's automorphism do not commute with the map, with the map is not constant. And so really the usual numbers that people usually consider for point U then connect to the zero curve with this one point, which means with one zero decay. So actually it could be that for kind of three for doing the show which is interesting with the center, they're not very interesting. Why do you write tau K1 of alpha one? Yeah, because some of the they are, I mean, they are both attached to a mark point, like psi one is attached to the mark point one, and alpha one is attached to the mm -hmm. mark point one. So they come together, and it's kind of a traditional notation to write it like that. So there is no thing in the special point. And they come from Newton's paper to write it. Yeah, and so, and so, yeah, so here you have my further remark, which is very much related to what you're asking. Is that in the story x does not have to be Calabriano, does not have to be of dimension three. So it's something you know, very much different from the physical string where you have very physical string that the couple to gravity and it has to the theory should be conformal or the correct functions in fixed four dimensions. And this in, in this story, it does not have, have to be. And in fact, even the like a two-dimensional sigma model. Does not have to be a well defined quantum theory. I mean, the topological twist, I mean, this final expression still makes sense. Mm -hmm. And some of all the things I will discuss, the new things I will discuss, they are essentially not interesting in the Calabrian three fold situation. They're really about looking at the kind of orthogonal direction, what most physics care about, which is looking to like X of arbitrary dimensions. What you think is not necessarily zero with any kind of possible representation.
Yeah, and so on. So for many purposes, the kind of your three story is the most interesting because the energy topological string is known in some case to be related to some supersymmetric part of the typical string, and then it connects to many, many, many bits. But so what I'm talking about now is kind of orthogonal to that. And maybe just a few comments like if X just you still some kind of physics related remark, which is the X is not cardinal, but some kind of final. Uh, the algebraic definition is that C1X with uh, C1X with a cardinal is roughly like which is flat, it's like a flatness condition, and this final is some kind of a positive commercial condition. So, for example, the projective space is. What you think? And in this case, a two dimensional sigma model of like a is not topological but honest one, maybe it's a bit honest two dimensional physical theory. So in the color below, it would be like a formal, but in this final case, it would be like asymptotically free. Mm -hmm. So at one loop, so as I said, there is a running of, of the metric because the metric is a coupling of this two-dimensional theory. And at one loop, there is some running given by the Ricci curvature. In the Ricci flat, there is no running, you don't have the formal. So the final case gets an asymptotically free yeah. In particular, you can have some interesting like a, like a long distance behavior. So for example, it's known that for CPN, and, and, and actually in the current you get n plus one massive. Okay, so, 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 so classically the sigma two-dimensional sigma model is always a conformally invariant, but at the quantum level, so this final thing is like QCD, it's asymptotically free, and you have dynamical breaking of conformal invariance, and actually the theory is massive. And we get one massive factor. And for more general final, the, what happens can, can depends. Sometimes you get some massive vector, sometimes you get some vector which are conformal, or you know, even slightly more complicated. And it happens that this topological string or this final somehow remember part of this information. Like the general zero part, you can cook up the quantum homogy ring. It's a quantum commodity ring. Remember a part of this information about the information the long distance behavior of this field. Sure. So, no, okay, maybe I should have that. So, maybe now I'll come. So we might be out of time, but so, so really, so this thing was like a very extended uh, introduction. So, so now the purely mathematical topic is given some explicit X. How do you compute this number? And here compute will maybe in a slightly loose sense. It will be like uh, having an algorithm, a cursive algorithm giving all the numbers. And maybe in some special cases, like kind of three form, maybe you want more. Maybe you want closed formula for generating series and things like that. But in complex reality, you cannot ask for, for, uh, for much. So we just say, like, compute it, can you find it? Just some algorithm to compute the number, purely combinatorial algebraic algorithm that you can put on the computer to compute this number. So the first case is if x is a point. So maybe it sounds a bit stupid, but actually it is not. So, so x is just geometrically a zero dimensional KDR manifold. And maybe it looks stupid, but the reason it's not stupid is because. This moody space is really a moody space not of curves inside X, but it's a moody space of curve of Fermat surface mapping to X. So actually, in this case, the moody space 
and the end beta of x. It's just a data of some movement surface. And then the data of a map to point, the unit map to point anyway, so you can forget that. And the clap of the zero. So this thing is a modal space of human surface. Which is very much non trivial and interesting. And, and in this case, so there is no alpha i, so all the interesting stuff going on is the gravitational distance. The gravitational lines of the points are integrals of product of powers of psi classes of the gravitational distance seven over the moody space of the human surface. The same numbers, so in this sense, are computable by, uh, so it's okay, by, Which proof so called Newton conjecture. If you think the story of the early 90s, and so there is a very long story, but in a very concrete way, what you think is saying is that explicit recursions of these numbers. With some explicit initial data with determined numbers of speed. This is a really long story. You can click on generating theory, the transformation of the KDV equation, the integrable hierarchy, and so stuff. But, but just as a very naive level of computation, there are just some explicit recursions, which give you a way to compute all the points. What about if you take x any manifold with beta equals zero? Yeah, so, so essentially, X any manifold beta equals zero. It sounds like it should reduce to this case. Up to some overall factor of order number of the Calabria or something like that. So, so definitely for Calabria or three that is known, what is the answer? Yes. Mm -hmm. And maybe in more general, yeah, I think the general is still known. But it requires there is a certainty which is exactly pointing to the question that you're asking. But when you try to use complete computation, there is extra commodity classes. Like you take beta equals zero, you start with psi and alpha, and you expect to reduce the whole thing over here. But then there is an extra piece which appears, like from there is some ultra bundle. So, well, there is a bit certainty, but I guess roughly it's mm -hmm. kind of known. Okay, so this thing is like the most basic starting point you might think about, just take the point. And some of everything else I will describe will be some kind of induction of recursion taking C story as a starting point. And yes, about the starting point is already non trivial. I mean, about C story is quite non trivial. It's not simple. It's just a piece of thing that we take as initial input. And already there, there is nothing more like, there is nothing. There is nothing like close for me. So this is kind of a cursing thing. But no, nothing more. Than that. Okay, so this thing is like an initial point. And then starting from that, we try to build more complicated space. So the kind of next space you might want to think about is projective space, complex projective space. So it's just like n plus one complex numbers. Not all zero and consider up to k in that system. So this thing is a nice compact complex manifold which has a lot of kernel which is allowed for, for the general discussion. And why this space is very nice is because it's very symmetric. So it has a big group of symmetry. Mm -hmm. There's a big there's a star of C star in the n plus one acting on this space. Simply you scale each of the factors by different each of the coordinates by different factors. So you get this really big torus acting on it. And there are only finitely many fixed points. And you can find this. And then it gives a very general theme. In mathematics, it's under group action. You might try to localize the effect of group action, reduce whatever you're trying to compute to something happening at a fixed focus of the action. And there is such a thing in some of the space with the localization. So 
So the upshot is that the growth identity of such a place can be reduced with the growth identity of the fixed locus, which is just a collection of points. And then, by the previous way, you can compute. So the point is that if your geometry is very symmetric, then you can reduce the point. And maybe I will go directly. I will not explain the intermediate case if I'm not before because the case of the server will describe it from Einman. So the next thing I want to describe it, so which is entitled to do with complete intersection. And so it's really complete intersection in the big display. So rather than to consider the big display, it's a very concrete way. To construct scalar manifold, which is algebraic geometry way, just to pick homogeneous polynomials with these variables and look to some sub right here for the space defined by the vanishing of these polynomials. This is my concept of F defined by some the vanishing of some polynomials FI, so FI is from three. If I move here for your little divisor of the room. And X is called a complete intersection if it can be defined by a number of equations exactly equal to its codiverse. So it's clear that if you have R equations. You can cut down the dimension by at most r. And if it is exactly r, it's called complete intersection. So maybe more geometrically, each of the hypersurface fi equal to zero is just intersect transverse. So definitely, if the fi are generic, so take generic fi, then it will be okay. Or you should just think about c scale. Just I pick generic polynomials of degree di, and I look to x defined by these equations, which has co-dimension r. And if I take a single equation, I get some hypersurface, and then you don't want to get some intersection of hypersurface. And if everything is generic, this thing will be smooth, and it will be a nice complex manifold inside my big uh, project space. Okay, so this is the famous example of the Travio 3 that people like. Like the quintic three fold so inside CP4, take a single equation homogeneous of GB5, you think in the Travio 3 fold. And in general, the varieties are, are more um, complicated. Sometimes they're Travio, sometimes they're Travio, sometimes they're they are very fancy. And so some of uh, the main result is the paper of which I referred to at the very beginning. That we give an algorithm Intersection for all x defined in the concrete way, not products of the projective spaces, and not so really we are, we are writing a very short comma mm. which will say something about product of projective space or weighted projective spaces. But even for product of projective space, they are certain things, and we cannot do all cases. So, so well, yeah, I will not have time to explain this other thing, but so the okay. or, original paper we just written for CPF. Okay. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then you might ask, what about generalization? And while writing a very small thing where you explain some generalization, but it's not actually it's not so easy to, to generalize in a like, big, in a big way. That's for example for the case of the static, if you study the computational complexity of this algorithm as a function of the DAG. I mean, yeah, yeah. So, so, so actually, so. 
For the particular case of the quantic three fold, there are already a similar result due to modic finite boundary. And it's a very complicated algorithm. In particular, this algorithm is unclear to use it, like for example, to prove real symmetry predictions about your theory, it's not it's not clear at all, it's not known that we use that to do for it. So it's just a very complicated set. And so our story is similar, just something very complicated. And uh, well, if you want, it's more some kind of theoretical result saying that some, like in principle, you can do it, but if you want concrete numbers, I mean, it, it, I guess it depends on your specific question. Maybe it's not very clear to do it. But did you calculate any CD invariant for the plating, for example, using this algorithm? Yeah, I think some people computed the genus 2 invariant and checked that it agreed with that. I mean, some genus 2 invariant and some other degree and checked that it agreed with that. But this is not published for yeah. Yeah. So you should really think of maybe to this kind of thing, something like theoretical result, thing, like in principle, if you want to do this. And maybe you have some other result which looks better, trying to say that we can compute in principle. There is something more interesting that you can say that rather than look to Gromoffitan numbers, you can look to so called Gromoffitan classes, like rather than to integrate to get a number, you can push forward to the modi space of Riemann surfaces to get interesting commodity classes from the modi space of. Surfaces. And then what you prove is that these classes live inside the nice so called tautological subring of the commodity ring of the body space of cut. I guess what I'm trying to say is that uh, you should use that as some kind of theoretical statement and then you can use it to prove interesting theoretical statements, <laughs> like which are more qualitative. I just think you can compute it, but there are some interesting properties. Of, of Is the algorithm based in terms of some explicit choice of uh, presentation for the variety as intersection of hypersurfaces or? Uh, so, so maybe I should have made the comment. So we made the rumor before that chromophilic environments are independent of the complex structure. So actually they only depend on the degree of the eyes and the dimension. They do not depend on specific choice of the polynomials. Okay. But, but definitely it uses this presentation as a complete intersection. Yeah. It depends on the kilo. No, sorry. I'm so sorry. Yeah, 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 so it depends on, yeah, so it depends on N, the dimension of the space and the various degree. Yeah. And that's it. Just like if you say quantic three, four in P4, you only need to know it's P4 and it is quantic. And then whatever specific quantic phenomenon we choose, you get different complex varieties, but they are all the same syntactically, all have the same chromophilic varieties. But the killer moduli only, only enter once you start constructing generating series of those centers. Yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. Is it possible in very simple terms to say where the complexity of this algorithm comes in? What, what makes it so, so terribly complicated to, to carry out? Yeah, so there are many steps. Also, I guess I would end by just giving an idea of just the basic point. So, you know, for projective space, the basic point was just that you have a big symmetry group and you can do a lot of So, as you say, for generic DI, we think are very much non linear. So there is no continuous symmetry acting in such X, so there is no hope to do something. something I know. So, maybe I should make a remark that it's sometimes stupid case if all the DI are one, we're just intersecting upper planes, everything is linear, we are just constructing a projective space of smaller dimension. Inside the bigger projective space. And this is scary kind of looking because there's no projective space. So the basic idea is try to do an induction of the degree to lower the degree to go back to this kind of initial case where all the degrees are one. So the very basic idea, some very classical idea in algebraic geometry is just the idea of degeneration. Okay, that as long as the fi's are generic, you get some smooth x. And for the Gromoffitan point of view, they're all the same. But sometimes, when the fi are non generic, x will become singular. And then, when x is singular, after Gromoffitan is no longer defined. But x can become singular in some interesting way. So, something which can happen is if you deform fr. In such a way that it becomes a product of two equations of degree dr1, 
two and two, but then the two degrees sum to the degree of kappa. So this thing is very much non-generic. Generic polynomial like that will never be a product of two polynomials of lower degree. But you might try to deform that to make it non-generic. And if you think what happens geometrically, so for example, you can just interpolate between you introduce a deformation parameter t, and you consider c is new object, and when t is not zero, generic, you get something generic, you get something smooth, as nice as x. But when t equals to zero, you have deformed to the product. And then when you want C thing to be equal to zero, either one of them can be equal to zero or the other. And when one of them is equal to zero, you get some space x1. Zero, or when the other is equal to zero, you get another space x2. And r2 equal to zero. And actually, so the, the, two, the total thing is a union of two pieces glued transversally along the divisor. So this thing is a singular geometry made of two smooth pieces intersecting transversely. So this thing is the intersection, which is the local component of the one and the other two. So maybe like an elementary version of this value, just look the equation x, y equal t, actually. If t is non zero, x has to be non zero, and y is determined by x, you just get x. So it's smooth. So when t equals to zero, you get x y equals to zero. So you get x and the point is that x1 and x2 are themselves complete intersections, but of lower degree. Because the degree here of the last equation has been split into one degree here and one degree here. So the basic idea is try to compute global invariance here in terms of global invariance of the two pieces. And you count, you count your Riemann subjective here. And then you try to understand what happens with the limit. And in the limit, typically your Riemann surface will break. Some bunch of curves on one side and some bunch of curves on the other side. And the basic idea is to try to take the information here, the information here, and try to glue them together to recover the information. And the most basic idea of the generation is there since the beginning of the subject in the more quickened series. It's something to me. Generation formula this is again roughly 20 years old. So I will come and then finish with some of the main points. So, so people knew that I've seen ID for a very long time, so 20 years. So in principle, you might want to do that. I will just end by pointing the basic difficulty why it was not known how to do it in practice. So assume that X, we take an explicit lower dimensional example that X with the cubic curves in CP2. So it's just a smooth elliptic curve. And if you split the degree three equation into degree two and degree one equation, if you break into a conic, the so topological is just a sphere, and you and on a line. Okay, that's a topologically just a sphere. So you have this kind of picture of a smooth empty curve, which degenerates into a singular empty curve. And the basic difficulty of the game is that in gromov witten theory, you have these classes alpha i's, which are various constraints which are imposed on your curves. <coughs> your alpha i's are Like homogy, or if you think generally, homogy classes on X. They impose your condition on your curve, not into X. Mm -hmm. And the key difficulty is that when you do this degeneration, you might lose some of these homogy classes. So there's a called vanishing cycle. So here, if you want to take alpha i to be in H1, which is your 
H1 of the token has rank two because X is cycle or C cycle. But on this fiber, one of the cycle of one of these cycles become homogeneously trivial because it shrink. So for this thing as of H1 of dimension one, so this thing survive. Mm -hmm. But this red thing just gives up here. So the Gromov-Witten question that you ask here are count some curves, Roman surface, that is in various conditions with respect to this red and blue cycle. Actually, this question does not make sense here because the red cycle has disappeared. So, so the so-called vanishing cycles. And again, so it was known that roughly 20 years ago, this thing was a main obstruction to, to, to make this program work. And, and so the main content of our paper is how to go around this issue. And I would just say a single sentence. There is a geometric ID, which is that rather than to count, so here what you want to count is curves with the various mark points. And then these alpha i's are like, are like related to the mark point. And the geometric ID is rather than to count curve with insertion of these classes, which do not make sense on the special fiber. We'll consider other kind of another kind of curves where you can curves like which are asked to be singular. You ask your curves to have some nodes, you ask them to be singular. And here you at the map point you do not put the one which vanish, you only put the one which are good. And then this kind of counts can go through the generation. And there is some hope to make sense of this stuff. So what is why I need to explain you why there is a relation between these two things. And the claim is that counting a curve with a node is the same thing as counting a curve with some nodes. That you open the node, you create two mark points, and you want these two mark points to map to the same point in X. So it is saying that you want at this point you want to insert the commodity class in the product of X with itself given by the diagonal. And then there is a fact in algebraic topology, which is that if you look to respect X, which is the diagonal inside X for X, you can ask what is this class inside the commodity as its product. And the fact is that if you have alpha i basis of the commodity of X, then the class of the diagonal is over i, eta, ij, alpha i, from alpha j, where eta ij is the four character, the metric of the commodity. So if you think of the fact in algebraic topology, and it says that counting invariant with nodes is the same as counting invariant with some nodes, where here we insert essentially all possible commodity classes. Because here it's a basis. So all possible commodity classes are contained inside the nodes. So the idea is to study the invariant we care about, which are insertions, which are commodity classes which do not pass to the special fiber. We turn them into nodes through the recipe, and then you have a generation to these nodes. And I would just stop there because I'm already in the time. So thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you so much. Other questions? So even if you didn't want to degenerate, sort of taking these nodal curves as a way of getting all uh, cohomology all observable insertions, well, some over all of them, then you would have to sort of tickle out which. Yeah, that's, right. so that's exactly the point that usually people do not consider as a because if, because of this weather, you can just open them and then compute them in terms of things we saw. And yeah, the main idea is to do the converse. We want to compute this thing with mark points, any possible kind of insertions. So there is some insertion we don't like. So we want to. Forget about them and replace it by nodes. And then, if we know this is right with nodes, then exactly what you just said, then if we know that, we know some kind of sum of the environments we care about. And so, there is no something wrong for, to show that you can recover the individual pieces. 
and you teach about some of the, the, the old game what the whole game is about so so, so at some point there is a very natural piece of linear algebra Well, essentially you create nodes in many ways so you get many different equations of these numbers mm -hmm. and you need to show that you can create as many equations as the nodes you get a very big matrix and you need to show that this very big matrix has a correct rank or is invertible and that you can invert the, the, the equation and i should say that in fact uses uses many things so it's like one geometric input is that the fact that chromophobic environments are invariant in the deformation of the complex structure implies natural relation between these numbers because you know, we, we start with some x defined by some equations fi and then you can just move the coefficient of fi around so that the corresponding space remains smooth so so the more you move in the space of polynomials in such a way that the variety remains smooth, and at some point you come back. And then what deformation variants say is that if you start with the class with alpha i, and you should deform them continuously around these paths, the gromov return variants do not change. But the point is that when you come back, maybe alpha i does not come back to alpha i, you can come back to a different class. Is an actual monotony action for the cohomology. And the reason for that is because in the middle, you have like co dimension two locus where x is singular. So you cannot go through such a thing. So the typical local model for that is you can consider a family of elliptic curve you know, with special fiber is singular, local elliptic curve. And when you go around, there is an actual monotony action for the first homology. Of the of the of the elliptic curve, there is one cycle which is invariant, but there is another cycle which is the elliptic curve. And the fact that the chromophobic variants are invariant means that actually there needs to be invariant elliptic action for the monotony of the cohomology. So if you know that this monotony is very big, it will give you many extrapolations that the chromophobic variants have to satisfy. And something which is specific to this case of CPN, which is why you cannot, you don't really know how to do the case of product of the data. That here, the monotony is as big as possible. It is a very big orthogonal group or symplectic group. And then you can use some invariant theory of orthogonal or symplectic group to constrain the, the environment. So really in this game, there is like two parts. One which is constraints that are known as much as possible by the monotony. And the other game is produced as many equations as possible by creating these nodes. And then there is some small miracle that some of these two things matches. Two things produce as many constraints and two things produce as many equations. And then there's a miracle and you match and you can do that. So which syntactic group do you have in mind here? Yeah, yeah. So what I'm talking about is a uh, that's clearly not the mon the, the monodromy is in Kelly moduli space, which would be familiar in this context. But uh, yeah, I mean here, here it is a modular here it is a monodromy is a complex complex moduli of which would be like uh, yeah. Can I move the line on the yeah, yeah, let's forget let's the one. Hmm. Yeah, so here it's just the fact that X, we look to its cohomology, so otherwise it's a most basic question because both is alpha i live in the cohomology of X. So the first question to ask is what is the cohomology of X? And somehow it's a general fact that the cohomology of X are some kind of decomposition. Some organ part, which is like restriction from commodity of the organ protective space, and some extra primitive part. And the general fact is that this primitive part always lives in middle degree. Mm -hmm. So if I have a solution and this thing lives in HM, and some because it's in 
middle degree, you have some intersection form on this space. I see. Like geometrically, you have two cycles of inversion, you can intersect them. So, commodically, you have two differential forms of that degree, you take the product of sub degree. Mm -hmm. And if M is uh, odd, which is formed with the syntactic, yeah, yeah. M is even, it is a symmetry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and because it's formed with some kind of something topological, this monodromy has to preserve it. Mm -hmm. So this monodromy group has to be contained inside this orthogonal syntactic group, which is part of the chronology. And the non-trial claim is that it is a okay, the same or same is that it is variously dense inside the complex orthogonal syntactic. And uh, so, you know, for the elliptic curve, it's just, you know, for the elliptic curve, just H1, the elliptic curve is just that point, like this physical coefficient. But here, the symplectic group actually just SL2Z. And here, yeah, for the elliptic curve, the claim is that uh, if you move around in the many space of the elliptic curve, any element of SL2Z can be realized by monotron. Mm -hmm. And for the elliptic curve is elementary, just like if you compare the A cycle, yeah, yeah. maybe you get something like that, and maybe if you do the B cycle the other way, maybe it uh, generates SL2Z. But for more general vectors, it's much more, more trivial yes. than anything we use. So, do I understand it correctly that if you study the Kumakui theory on X, you study the monogamies in the complex structure like model like that? Yeah. X and so, for the Quintic, you would have like XP 200 set. Uh, yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. For the quantity, it will not be interesting because you think you look to the fraction on the on the insertions. Yeah. 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 Maybe for the quantity, you insert the. But, but this is kind of the order of yeah. magnitude. That, that mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's like geometry. Yeah. Yeah. So you do not uh, look at any particular generator of swing of each. No. 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 I mean, you just consider some kind of abstract very big. Yeah. Yes, and indeed they can be as big as this. It's a very big. Yeah. Okay. No, no further other questions. I think we should thank Pierrick again and we can continue our lunch. <laughs>